Hello everybody, my name is Richard Orme from the DAISY Consortium and I'm your host for today's webinar. We'd like to extend a very warm welcome to this session entitled Publishing Accessibility W3C Standards. Where are we and how do we get here? This is the first of two webinars examining the revolution of born accessible digital publications. Part two will consider the future of accessible publishing and standards. Where are we going? I'll remind you about that session again at the end. But let's get started. I'm thrilled to hand you over to our panelists who will introduce themselves and ponder where are we and how do we get here? Hi, I'm Bill Kasdorf. I'm a uh, publishing technology consultant, uh, an independent consultant. I usually describe my uh, consultancy as markup modeling, metadata, publishing information infrastructure, uh, editorial production workflows, pra best practices and standards alignment, and accessibility. But actually, accessibility is a part of all those things, so I shouldn't list it as a separate thing. That's what I do. Hello, I'm Luc Audrin. I am um, retired, just retired from Hachette Live, and I am an inclusive publishing consultant for the moment. And I've been working on accessibility uh, for uh, ebooks uh, inside Hachette Live and for France and uh, Europe uh, for many years. And I'm really happy to let you know what we did inside the W3C where I was co-chair of the publishing business group for some years, for since 2017, since its creation. Since uh, it's a very big honor to me for to present you the situation uh, where we are now. And my name is George Kirscher. I'm Chief Innovations Officer with the DAISY Consortium and Senior Officer of Global Literacy with, with Benetech. I also mentioned that I am blind and use a screen reader and all of this access technology that is uh, evolving in publishing is just wonderful to see. Okay, this is Bill. I'm uh, first up today. So I'll be talking about publishing technology. I'll then hand it over to Luke, who'll give you a more detailed description of the current EPUB ecosystem that he's of course had a great hand in building. Uh, and then following Luke will be George, uh, really talking about baking in accessibility in terms of your systems and your content, everything you do. And we're going to leave plenty of room for uh, discussion at the end. So let's get going. Um, I, I've been saying for actually a few years now that accessibility is more accessible than ever. The publications we produce are more accessible, the systems that we're using are more accessible, and the devices that we use to access those publications are more accessible. And why is that? It's because of how publishing technology has evolved. So step back a few years, I guess 50 years is more than a few to most of you, not to me, uh, when publications are printed by letterpress, the actual pre pressing ink into paper, and then they were consumed on that paper. And systems involved in producing them, well, the writing was done on typewriters, manuscripts were mailed to a publisher, the editors use red pencils to mark in the margins, went to a typesetter who sat at a linotype machine casting lead. That lead was put in a printing press and books were printed and bound and they were shipped on trucks to bookstores and people went to bookstores and bought them, paid with cash at cash registers. Is that all sounding like, are you kidding me? That's how it actually was? Yeah, that's how it was. And the reason I'm describing it in such detail is it's inherently inaccessible, every aspect of that is inaccessible. So yeah, you could read the book at the end of the day, if you can read the book, that is, if you can handle it properly and turn the pages properly, and if you can see the print. So uh, just so that you don't think I'm making that up, this is a picture of me in 1971, uh, printing uh, poetry chapbooks for the University of Wisconsin in the typography lab. That was my start in publishing. Uh, so in the early digital era, typesetting did become digital. Uh, Shortly, actually, it had begun in the, in the early 70s when that picture was taken. But the manuscripts that were being typeset were still typed on typewriters. And the systems that were used were all proprietary systems. Publishers used proprietary markup that was presentational. In other words, the markup basically just said what, uh, what a content object looked like. It didn't say what the object was. 
Uh, and then, you know, when those marked up manuscripts went to uh, a designer and then a typesetter, typically the, the, the designers made up the codes for an individual book one by one. Uh, or or if, if they're using InDesign, which came along a little bit later, making up the style names one by one. And the typesetters did the same thing. Um, and so you, you get the message here that there was no consistency, even though we now had some digital files, it still resulted in a print book. And so what that meant was assistive technology basically just had to start from scratch with the print book to make an accessible product. And they, they use very specialized systems. The, the, making the access, accessible product use specialized systems and specialized coding and consuming the, the accessible product also use specialized systems and specialized coding. So fast forward to today, and this is why I'm, I'm just so enthusiastic about where we've gotten and uh, echoing George's comment about we're just thrilled at how publishing technology has, has advanced to the point where it's just inher inherently able to be made accessible. Uh, every step of the workflow is digital, even producing print. It's a digital workflow. I did a book a number of years ago called The Columbia Guide to Digital Publishing, and it was massively misinterpreted that it was about ebooks. It wasn't. It was about everything about publishing by the time that, publishing, that book was published was digital. Authors used word processing software. They didn't use typewriters anymore. Uh, the editorial and production workflows were entirely digital. Um, at the, increasingly, we consume, and today, of course, we consume lots of our content on the web. Uh, and we also do a lot of reading on phones and tablets and apps, and ebooks are commonplace. <clears throat> and why this is so fundamental is that assistive technology benefits from digital files, digital systems, digital devices. And the accessibility of those things benefits from interoperability and open standards, which are really key to where we are today. Uh, web technology is really fundamental to all of this. The whole publishing technology tool chain is based on web technologies. The markup is XML and HTML. CSS is used for rendering. I'll get to why that's significant in a minute. Uh, there's a, a standard you may not be familiar with called ARIA, which is used for structural semantics. Uh, there's a, a XML format called MathML for math. Tables are increasingly coded as HTML tables. Um, and why this is so important is for a couple of reasons. First of all, all of those technologies are free, open, interoperable W3C standards. And virtually all publishers, not just the publishers, but their vendors and their suppliers all use those technologies. They all know how to use them. They use them every day. And they're now the basis for accessible publications, which is EPUB3. EPUB is entirely built on web standards and George will uh, go through the history of how we got to that point because way back when that was the, that was the vision. HTML markup is the basis for the markup and it, uh, assistive technology now is built to understand HTML markup. And I mentioned that CSS is significant. That's cascading style sheets and what that is is the technology that specifies the presentation of the content separately from the markup in the content itself. In other words, it it, it, it is based on a content markup, but the content markup, instead of saying this thing should be bold, says this thing is a level one heading, et cetera. Um, and then uh, that HTML markup has been uh, supplemented by ARIA uh, markup, which are uh, one of the things that ARIA does is provide roles for, for a content object. So for example, uh, HTML uses sections, ARIA enables you to specify the section as a chapter. Uh, uh, HTML uses a, a tag called aside for something that's out of the, the linear text flow. ARIA lets you say that that's a footnote, et cetera. And also MathML and HTML tables are understood by accessive technology, accessive assistive technology. And again, as I said before, virtually all publishers and the vendors and suppliers that they work with all use these technologies. So what does this mean? It means that in today's workflows, publications can be born accessible. That was coined by Betsy Bowman of Benetech and it's a, she was at a conference where she was hearing the phrase born digital and she thought, well, if it's born digital, it should be born accessible. Uh, and 
so what we're, what we're working on today, and this is increasingly the case, is that accessible EPUB 3s can be just a standard product of workflows. But here's the catch. You have to use this technology properly. Uh, EPUB 3 doesn't guarantee accessibility. It enables accessibility. Uh, for several years now, I've been trying to get some traction with the word accessibility ability, the ability to be made accessible. I guess it's no surprise why that hasn't gotten any traction, but you get my point. Uh, some of the things that are really fundamental, but you, you do have to get these things right in your EPUBs for them to be properly accessible, is that you've got to use the HTML markup properly, including, for example, the headings H1 to H6 have to be nested properly, et cetera. The content has to give you a logical reading order. Uh, it needs to provide enough structural markup to enable navigation. Uh, and again, these are things that sighted users take for granted, but you need to be able to jump to chapter five if you want to jump to, if you want to just get, start reading the chapter five. And you need to be able to skip over content. If there's a sidebar that you don't need to see or you, want, you don't want to read the footnotes, you, you need to be able to skip those. Well, the print disabled user depends on the markup in the content to be able to do that. And the big one that is really fundamental is that images need descriptions. Any images that provide content that are not just decorative have to have descriptions. So those are not rocket science. Most of the vendors can do most of these things. The, the trickiest of them is the image descriptions, but increasingly it's become much, much easier to get those right. So um, ideally at the end of the day, accessibility should just work. The, the, the publications, the systems, the devices that we're using all use web technology. Accessibility is really fundamental. And so you should be able to expect those things, the publications, the systems, and the devices to be accessible. So accessible EPUB 3s can be a standard product of workflows. Websites and publications can be navigated by keyboard access. And somebody that can't see the screen or can't touch the screen uh, can, can navigate through the document properly. Um, Phones and other devices are, are just built now to read text aloud. It's, you know, every iPhone uh, in existence can read, can read text to you. Uh, and even videos often have closed captions with them. So those are all things that are important for accessibility and much of that technology was invented by the accessibility community and it's now commonplace. And guess what? They make the publications better for everybody. So at this point, I'll turn this over to Luke and Luke, you can tell us how we got here and where we are now. Yes, thank you, Bill. Yes, how did we come to this uh, EPUB ecosystem? It all started with IDPF, uh, International Digital Publishing Forum in 2006, which published the EPUB 2 uh, first specification. Uh, why two? Probably because uh, previously there was a uh, open ebook uh, standards that was considered as EPUB 1, but EPUB 2 was there and it, used, it was used several years and um, it was a, a very first in, interesting step to produce ebooks uh, using web technologies. But these technologies were uh, um, those available at that time, HTML4 and CSS2, but, and even those technologies were not fully deployed in EPUB 2. It was only uh, a part of them, there were restrictions. Uh, the big effort was done in 2010, 2011 with um, DAISY Consortium uh, CTO, uh, Marcus Killing, uh, which was who was also the CTO of uh, IDPF, and um, with this uh, energy, with this um, collaboration between Daisy Consortium and IDPF, and at that moment there was several hundred organizations, members of IDPF, uh, all over the world, and um, it was a real advancing uh, in in technologies in, in EPUB 3.0 was published in uh, November 2011. It was the best uh, EPUB uh, because it was using the latest technologies in the web, HTML5, CSS3, and also mainly uh, Unicode, meaning that any, um, any language of the world could be uh, used inside EPUB. And uh, it was very interesting for those countries with specific scriptures like uh, Japan, Arabic people, and so on. Uh, 
Uh, EPUB 3 was marketed uh, primarily um, for the possibilities of in multimedia and, and scripting and interactivity, but it was not um, the main uh, speech. Uh, and uh, obviously it was much better than EPUB 2, even in what EPUB 2 was able to do text and, and for simple books. Uh, and then um, it, really um, was in, in, uh, interesting for trade publishing because um, it was in, inside the specification of EPUB 3 was accessibility. As Bill explained, it was accessibility enabling uh, in EPUB 3. Um, so the years went by and by, there was a lot of effort to make EPUB 3 adopted. It was not adopted at the very beginning. There were some initiatives like, like Redium foundation and the Redium is software and, and so on. There was also a test suite of EPUB 3 files available on, on the IDPF or, uh, website. And there was also some anticipation uh, for the future in, inside IDPF and we worked on uh, EPUB 3.1. And this EPUB 3.1 was a tentatively uh, improvement on, on web technologies uh, to go further and it was in advance, I may say, because it was never adopted. It, there was no one uh, adopting EPUB 3.1. Um, and particularly, there was an issue with the, 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 the very interesting free tool, EPUB Check, who uh, help us to say that if an EPUB file is really conformant to the specification. EPUB check le was left uh, in the air uh, in 2016. There was no more development and particularly it was not addressing the new, re the, this release EPUB 3.1. So it, it, we were in an uncomfortable si uh, position at that moment uh, and, and we wanted to, to or the publishing industry to move to EPUB 3 and uh, we think that uh, web technology was at the heart of, of uh, EPUB, so there was a movement that is explained next slide, please Bill. And it, there was a movement in IDPF to, to, to come near uh, the web technologies and the uh, movement of merging inside uh, W3C was initiated and that was uh, resolved in 2017. It was then uh, some uh, label created that was publishing at W3C with several groups. And it was, um, the movement was very interesting for EPUB and the publishing community because it helped us to be at the very heart of where te web technologies are uh, written and uh, um, forged. And um, this was, very interesting. And uh, there was um, uh, uh, several groups created. Uh, there was a publishing working group for the future standards. And that's not the, our webinar today, but it's the next one for the future. But for the maintenance of EPUB 3, which was already existing, um, a community group was created. And this community group took in charge this uh, EPUB 3 specification. Uh, it was a, a free uh, membership uh, group and it was, it, it's very active. There is more than 250 people there. And this very active group did a, a, a tremendous job to, to bring, the, to, to, maintain, to maintain EPUB 3 specification. And there was another group, publishing business group, who was there to look at the global uh, industry, uh, publishing industry, and to make the EPUB 3 ecosystem um, well, in a well position, in a better position, I would say. And what was the, 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 the goal of the publishing business group? It was to, to put back EPUB 3 at its highest value, meaning uh, not in, in this, in, leaving this uncomfortable situation and to make it more stable and future-proof. And other, another goal was then to obviously to tell to the publishing industry that EPUB 2 uh, was um, obsolete somehow, because even in the, in the simple 
and full uh, capacity of EPUB2, uh, not speaking of multimedia and interactivity and JavaScript and so on, uh, EPUB3 did better. And uh, particularly because EPUB3 was uh, accessible by nature in its specification. So what did the publishing and the see uh, um, for EPUB3 in, in this, uh, these last years until now? There was a revision of the specification, which was done by the EPUB3 community group. And this revision was done in this large group uh, with a lot of consensus and it revisited the version of EPUB uh, specification so that it comes to a new release which is fully compatible with EPUB 3.0. There is no issue of compatibility that was the case with EPUB 3.1. And in the same time, this uh, new release want to be full future-proof, meaning that they will build it on the latest uh, HTML and CSS, not this specific version, but the latest version that uh, of HTML and CSS that the W3C will ever publish. And this was successful in May 2019. It was published as a final report by this community group and the name of it is EPUB 3.2. You have the link in the, in the slide. This EPUB 3.2 is uh, the, the best ever EPUB specification we ever had. And also the publishing business group main, main uh, work for the EPUB uh, ecosystem globally. Um, first of all, it start, we started a revision of uh, EPUB check because as I said, since uh, 2016, nothing was done. So we launched a two years plan for uh, development of EPUB check to fix it and to upgrade it. And um, this plan is not finished. It will be finished uh, this year in 2020. There is still some actions of development like test suite, um, uh, API, uh, documentation, it's, uh, and the DAISY consortium is working on it uh, still now. And the publishing business group also uh, in parallel initiated this international fundraising call so that we can make this uh, revision of EPUB check uh, fully uh, developed. And, uh, this call has uh, raised most, almost the, the, the full money we need, but it, I, I use this uh, webinar to call once more for help because as you can see, we still list, miss uh, $10,000, K dollars. So you have here also the link and just after the webinar, I encourage you to click and to donate. <laughs> But these two actions were really very important for the, the EPUB3 ecosystem. And we are now with stable specifications, fully backward and also future-proof. And we have also in parallel EPUB accessibility 1.0, which is now a W3C document. Um, you may find it on the W3C website. And uh, this uh, EPUB accessibility is the, the, the specification to, to explain exactly what is uh, the goal of EPUB accessibility in EPUB 3. And you have this accessibility techniques document that explains precisely what is to, has to be done um, with every tags, uh, um, HTML attributes and metadata. It's very clear and it's uh, it's possible to, to explain exactly how to build EPUB born accessible EPUB. And also for quality assurance that we have now these two free tools that are uh, up to date, EPUB check validate now EPUB 3.2 uh, specification. And don't forget that any accessible EPUB, any born accessible EPUB is first of all a valid EPUB. So EPUB check is fundamental. And then this ACE tool, Accessibility Checker for EPUB, help us to be sure that the techniques that bring accessibility inside EPUB 3.5 are correctly used. And this tool uh, enables publishers to be clear with that, but also their suppliers. 
so that the full production workflow is okay. And last slide for my part. <laughs> so trade publishers have been trying to, to start with accessibility. Uh, I, I, many publishers over the world are doing their best effort and doing real production, uh, like Bill explained, with workflows. I can speak about Hachette Leave, where, where I spent some almost 20 years. <laughs> and this large group uh, for its internal publishing houses decided that in 2018, any new titles published in EPUB 3 should be born accessible, meaning that the workflow has put uh, ACE at, as one of the checking tools besides EPUB check and the others. We forbid also any new titles in EPUB 2. And for that, for that effort, we, we, went, we won uh, an, an International Excellence Award, so we are very happy with that. And in 2019, we have added EPUB Check 4.2, and um, we also signed the Accessible Book Consortium Charter, meaning that we are committed to accessibility. So, in also, just before I left in March 2020, after producing every new title for simple books in EPUB 3 Born Accessible, we also uh, managed to push for each of these new titles, the metadata, to all the distributors in Onyx Fields. That's an example. There are many others over the world, but it's uh, to show that it's possible to go to this route. So I give now the word to, to George, who will explain more about accessibility inside EPUB. Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, so I'm going to be talking about baking in accessibility because it's not frosting that's spread on after the fact. We mean we're talking about integrating accessibility into all aspects of, of publishing. I'm going to talk about how we did that. Um, we're going to look at the various domains. I'm not going to go through the rest of this slide because the other slides address uh, each of these domains. So, uh, Bill, next slide. So, first of all, um, uh, within the W3C is the Web Accessibility Initiative, which brings you many of the great things like w WCAG 2.0 and now 2.1 um, that I think most people are aware of, certainly for the web, but it also applies to publishing because publishing is based on um, HTML, CSS, and, and these things, and we can use WCAG uh, and to, uh, with EPUB files. So the, the DAISY staff are assigned to work on a, a wide range of activities within, within the W3C and within publishing in the W3C. So Avnish was elect Avnish Singh, our COO for Daisy, was uh, elected to the advisory board for um, for the W3C. Uh, Matt Garish, uh, myself, and Avnish work on uh, the uh, WCAG. Romain is working on validation at W3C. And he's also the lead coder for EPUB check and one of the lead coders for ACE we'll talk about in a second. And other DAISY okay. consortium members like Benetech are, um, have people assigned to various working groups and Charles Lapierre is, is one of those great contributors. And I've been chairing the steering council of the um, web accessibility initiative since, since it began. Next slide. So the legal framework, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we, we worked with them and made sure that the um, issues surrounding publishing and accessibility were, were baked in to, to that international treaty. We, uh, we know that ADA and 508 
um, apply to the web, and we've been working on pushing that into into publishing. And now 508 requires uh, accessible office doctrinal. And now the EU directive, uh, which is coming to into effect uh, in the years between uh, 2022 and 2025, have a clear uh, mandate to make sure published materials are accessible. So next slide. So we focused on standards from the very beginning. So people from the blindness community integrated in with the very beginning of all of the digital publishing that was, that was happening that started in 1999. We engaged technically and we also uh, integrated with the um, oversight and the officers uh, in, in these various organizations. So the whole business was integrated, not only technical things. We brought in technical expert like, like Marcus Gilling, who was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, who was the CTO for uh, the DAISY Consortium. And he also became the CTO of IDPF, the International Digital Publishing Forum. So you get this um, a baking in aspect where the best people in accessibility are leading developments in publishing. We initiated the, um, the EPUB accessibility conformance and discovery specification um, within uh, the IDPF and, the, uh, and now in the W3C. Uh, thank you to, to Google for funding, uh, Google Impact Challenge that helped us uh, pay for these things. And we've moving um, this back into ISO and right now it's being voted on in the United States by NISO, N-I-S-O. And if you haven't voted yet and you're a member of NISO, get out and vote. And uh, Matt Garish um, from DAISY is the editor of the, um, the various specifications at the W3C and in the IDPF. He's an accessibility expert. So whenever anything is put into a specification, it, it's put in by him, he's writing it in and he knows accessibility inside and out. Next slide. So authoring and publishing, ACE by DAISY, which was mentioned, um, that does the automatic checking of uh, the, the book, but you can only do so much with automatic checking. And so we created the simple manual uh, accessibility reporting to, which is like a checklist on steroids. And ACE generates a, a report, a human readable report, and a JSON report that gets pulled into smart and you can go through and manually check the things you need to do. And there's data visualizations that are provided to make it easier to check manually these things. The, all the images are shown along with their alt text and surrounding material. There's um, a data visualization of the structure of the book and a listing of the accessibility metadata. And the DAISY knowledge base is linked um, uh, from all of these, all of these tools linked to the knowledge base, which is maintained by uh, Matt Garish and uh, the rest of us contribute and review um, to make sure that the best practice for accessibilities are front and centers and easy to find. So all of those tools are integrated. 25, slide 25, conformance and discovery metadata. So inside, the uh, EPUB accessibility conformance and discovery specification is metadata. It first of all points to WCAG, um, double uh, WCAG 2.0. We didn't reinvent anything. We just point to what's there. We also added uh, uh, requirements that are specific to publishing that the web really don't know anything about page numbers, for example, footnotes, these don't exist on the web, but they sure do exist in publishing. 
conformance metadata points to um, the WCAG and EPUB and is specified in the metadata that travels with the EPUB. Also, certification metadata, who certified this? Was it self-certified or certified by a third party? And discovery metadata that is intended to be exposed in catalogs and bookstores to make sh when people buy, uh, so that people can buy born and accessible. So if, you, if the accessibility metadata is there and you can see it, you can see it's accessible, that's the one you wanna buy. Next slide. So we've got reading system and apps that are being tested and we test for accessibility. A whole lot of different assistive technologies are used to test the various reading apps and systems. Um, on all platforms with all kinds of different disability group. We provide the feedback to developers so that they can improve their reading system. And the next time there's a, uh, a release, we're notified and we test. And if they've got questions, they come to us for help. And we make public information available about all the apps that's out on inclusivepublishing.org. Um, and we do a roundup of all the different reading systems and how well they work with different technologies. So slide 27. So when we, when we do our testing, we identify issues and sometimes it's not with the reading system, but it's with the assist assistive technology itself. And so we can provide feedback to them and uh, let them know how to improve their product. And of course, this pr improves the, a the assistive technology as well. Um, and next slide. So distribution outlets and libraries. We are producing, and this is in the community group at W3C, which is free to join a user experience guide because this um, metadata is not really intended for human consumption. It's more machine readable, but it's so it gets translated. And we wanna see all the bookstores and libraries make expose this accessibility metadata. Again, supports the buy born accessible. And we want everybody to be buying born accessible. And last, in higher education, we've got a EPUB and higher education working group, and we're looking at getting higher ed adopting uh, EPUB. The publishers are there. Literally all of the top publishers now are producing born accessible uh, EPUB, EPUB 3. Um, they're working on getting uh, certified by Benetex, uh, global Certified Accessible Program. Many of the publishers are doing that now. Um, and we're doing a whole bunch of webinars that explain, this is in the higher ed space, uh, about EPUB and we're in the process of planning uh, next, uh, next year's sessions right now. We did identify barriers and then we set out to address those. We now have word to EPUB and all the other uh, word processors produce EPUB and we'd like to see professors starting to produce EPUB themselves and, and put uh, that EPUB out there alongside the PDFs that they normally do. And we still need to get this kind of initiative going in K-12. So what we'd really like to see is a whole society that's inclusive and embraces accessibility. We know that access to information is a civil right and ADA lawyers will tell you that all the time, but in the information age, access to information is a human right. And the publishing industry has just been terrific. They have embraced accessibility. It's being woven into their, into their workflows and baking it in right from the very beginning. So 
I would love to see teachers in, in middle school, when we start teaching writing, for the students to be creating born accessible doc documents from the very beginning. And it's not that hard. So I'm going to wrap there. Thank you so much, Bill, Luke, and George. So, uh, Bill, you have the control. If you would move us to the contact slide, that would be wonderful. So we're going to cover as many questions as we can, but please take a moment to note down the contact information. This will be posted on our webinar page uh, in the next few days, but you can reach Bill Kasdorf at kasdorf.bill, that's K-A-S-D-O-R-F dot Bill, B-I-L-L, -L, at gmail.com. Luke can be reached at Luc Audrin, which is L-U-C point A-U-D-R-A-I-N at edit natax, which is E-D-I-T-N-A-T-A-X dot info. And George can be reached at Kersher, K-E-R-S-C-H-E-R -E -E at Montana dot com. Uh, so they're there to take your questions, but we have some time for questions now and a bit of discussion. So let's get stuck into that. Um, one of the questions we have um, was really about, um, Bill, you talked about the transition from the kind of uh, old fashioned ways of doing things to the digital uh, type things. When would you say that transition really took place? Is that in the last year or so, or is it longer ago where content was being produced digitally and being consumed digitally? It's actually been happening for, for years. It's been a very gradual uh, evolution, but it's accelerated in the past couple of years. Uh, and again, I, I usually attribute this to the fact that the standards all fell into alignment. So, you know, global accessibility standards are basically all based on um, WCAG and the other W3C accessibility standards. Uh, they used to differ. Uh, they they differ much less than they used to. And the fact that the tools and technologies that not just publishers use, but publishers, suppliers, and vendors use uh, are the same standards that are required for accessibility. One quick comment, because I don't want to take too much time with this answer, is that I, uh, in terms of something that really accelerated this development in the last couple of years is the influence of important publishers. And I would uh, Kudos to Luke at Achette, uh, because by doing what he did with Achette Livre in France, one of the largest trade publishers in the world, thousands and thousands of books, where they made it, all of their vendors had to deliver born accessible EPUB 3s. What that means, you know, many people think the publishers make the EPUB 3s. Pretty much no, the vendors of the publishers make the EPUB 3s. And they basically trained the vendors, and so now they're lots and lots of vendors out there in the, in, in the ecosystem that know how to do this properly. The same thing happened in higher education. Another one I'll, I'll highlight is uh, Macmillan Learning. Uh, they, in fact, they were the uh, winner this year of the ABC uh, Inclusive Publishing Award. Um, and again, they spent a lot of time and effort working with their vendors to really get the vendors to know how to do accessibility right. And those vendors are now available to do that same work for, for other people. And I'm going to jump in and say that now with the Word to EPUB tool, um, anybody, um, independent authors, professors, uh, anybody can produce born accessible documents. They need to follow um, uh, normal, use the, use the heading structure, um, name styles in Word, and use the functions that are there for creating footnotes and citations, and that all automatically comes out as 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 accessible. And quite frankly, now that that tool is out, uh, I think that's going to hopefully put some pressure on Pages and Google Docs and InDesign to up the ante a little bit and improve their accessibility output of their of their materials. So George, way, while you have the mic, um, so Daisy, Daisy did that. <laughs> uh, so while you have the mic then, George, a couple of questions to you that I'll combine. One is, well, we've heard a lot about the industry and the technology, but could you kind of set out for us or help bring to life what difference this can actually make 
to a reader or a learner who has a print disability? What impact does all this technology mean for them? And then the link question to that is, how does uh, a librarian or someone working in university tell whether an EPUB is an accessible EPUB? Okay, so um, first of all, uh, the, the World Blind Union has had this chant, we want the same book at the same time at the same price. And now with the publishers producing accessible materials and in higher education, the publishers I'm seeing are putting in extended descriptions. So complex graphics are, are fully described. There's no need to go to um, a, a service, your disabled student service office, or to a organization that has traditionally served people with disabilities, which is separate and apart. They can just buy the book and start, start reading it. And the second question is that uh, it's the same answer uh, applies to libraries and to bookstores. So for example, Vital Source, when they ingest the EPUB, the accessibility metadata, the schema.org metadata is inside, it's baked in to the, to the EPUB. The accessibility summary, that is a human readable description of the accessibility features of this book, conforms to certified, all of these things are right there. And they can extract that when they ingest it and make it available um, uh, on their website. And they've been doing this for um, quite a while. So, you know, and, and the publishers are producing Onyx metadata about the accessibility of the book uh, as, as well, code page 196. So librarians need to put, and, and professors need to put policies in place that say, we're going to buy Born Accessible, we demand Born Accessible, we want to see the accessibility metadata, and if we don't see it, we're not going to buy it and then they need to expose that in their library catalogs or their bookstores. Thank you, George, for that. Question to you, Luke, was around a certification of publishers' workflows and their titles. So as someone who was for a long time working right in the heart of the publishing industry, could you speak to the question of the third party certification and maybe also self-certification you know how what's the importance of this in order to give uh, buyers uh, end users institutional customers kind of confidence about the quality of, of titles in terms of accessibility the first step of uh, certification is uh, almost uh, at, at the heart of the publisher production because uh, publishers have to make their suppliers produce born accessible EPUB using the techniques and, and also the free tools to, to check, like accessibility checker for EPUB. Uh, obviously, the publishers also have to work with their uh, authors uh, in, in to make uh, image descriptions available. That's uh, something that really at the heart of uh, editorial process with uh, the question of the context uh, of this image in this book. Then, then um, all this is done by the publisher and obviously the first step of making uh, the information available that this EPUB has been built using the best knowledge and tools to make it born accessible is a first step of information. This is not a certification, it's an auto declaration, but it's really very important to have this first step. We don't have it right now for many publishers and many suppliers and many websites, even if the publishers push information about how this uh, EPUB has been built using the best knowledge and, and process to make it born accessible. The, the websites uh, and for, for librarians and also to, to buy ebooks don't show get this information that's very important and it will this is uh, also uh, inside the european accessibility act that will enforce for all the the, the 
the step of the supply chain, uh, this information to be visible about accessibility and uh, the website will have to display that in, in, in when the, the uh, European Accessibility Act will be enforced in 2025. So every piece of the supply chain has to be ready. And obviously there are some uh, very high level certification process by some suppliers like Benetech or, um, and, and then in, in that case, it's really high level certification and you may have a, a very good stamp and you are sure. But this is a, um, a continuous process of information in many for many books, and I, I, I know well the trade part and less the, the, the education part, but for the trade part, uh, auto declaration by the publishers is really a, a very interesting first step to, to enable um, uh, visually impaired people to find books as soon as they are published in digital format with a large uh, quality, uh, very high quality of accessibility. This is the end of the book famine and we are working, we are, we are on it, we are on it now. Well, uh, we're hearing about... Can George, I add quick? just a little bit to that? It's uh, um, that whenever a publisher is producing something, they're actually making an assertion that this is accessible and third party certification affirms that and it helps them with areas that, where they see problems. Also, I'd note that with the ACE GUI that's out now, we have the ability to edit the accessibility metadata inside the EPUB. So that's a nice new feature. Mm. Thank you for being brief. We're gonna squeeze in one, maybe two more questions. And this one, uh, Bill, is to you because you, you work with such a range of uh, the, the vendors and publishers. This comes from Alice, who's working directly with students, providing them with accessible formats. Alice's experience was when she was looking for titles on the various platforms, she wasn't finding the titles that the students needed in EPUB. And what's your crystal ball for where, you know, how many books are available in EPUB and when will all books be available in EPUB that the students need? Um, first of all, uh, I don't know whether she's referring to higher ed or uh, K through 12 education. Higher ed is going to come much sooner uh, than the K through 12 because of the um, formatting and the, kind of the visual aspects that are often so fundamental in K through 12. But um, oftentimes uh, there are EPUBs available, but um, the campuses, the disability services offices, uh, et cetera, even the, the students asking for uh, accessible content are not yet completely familiar with how to use EPUB or the fact that EPUB is so inherently accessible uh, and so much better than uh, the formats they're used to. Uh, I'm, I'm in a um, Mellon funded project with uh, academic libraries, disability services offices, and three big repositories, uh, Bookshare, Internet Archive and HathiTrust to try to address this problem uh, because um, it's, a lot of it at this point, the barrier is education more than it is the technology. The technology is pretty much there, uh, but the education is lagging. Thank you for that. Uh, and the last question, which we'll just squeeze in before we wound up is from Paige. And Paige is talking about uh, working as a librarian within a very lean operation and the importance of open educational resources. So we've talked a lot about, you know, publishers and vendors. What's the relevant of all this amazing journey to open educational resources? And who'd like to pick that one up? Well, I let me just start by saying that that most of the OER that's out there is is not using EPUB uh, today. Uh, however, they uh, the tools that they're using to produce the OER, like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, do support uh, EPUB. And I think we need to see a push in OER to use. Uh, EPUB as the format, also to include the accessibility metadata, because the the publishers in higher ed are really having their toes held to the fire to produce born accessible great materials. The OER 
uh, needs to meet those same high standards. Thank you for that. Well, we're coming to the end of the session now. Uh, Bill, if you'd like to move the slide on to the next uh, one. So thank you, uh, everyone who's joined us for today's uh, webinar. And Bill, Luke, George, thank you for sharing your wonderful insights and information. Just to remind you, this was the first of two webinars examining the revolution of born accessible digital publications. On June the 3rd, part two, we'll consider the future of accessible publishing and standards. Where are we going? And coming up, next slide please, Bill, in the next few weeks, we're delighted to bring you representatives from Amazon, Google, Adobe, and Apple, together with other esteemed panelists from a fantastic variety of organizations. On May the 13th, we have easy access to books and articles through a smart speaker. On May the 20th, we have leveraging InDesign for accessible EPUB creation. And on May the 27th, uh, we have accessibility at Apple. You can find out more information at daisy.org slash webinars, where you can also sign up to the webinar announcement mailing list to learn about new topics as we add them. And if you'd like to suggest a subject, or if you're considering presenting a webinar yourself, then please email us at webinars at daisy.org. We didn't get to all the questions this time, that always happens, but we will reach out to you if there is something left hanging, we will follow up on those questions. So thank you for those questions. I hope you'll join us again next week. In the meantime, thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day.